Good morning, everyone. Buongiorno. For anyone who doesn't know me, I'm Abigail Brandine, the director of the British School at Rome. Um, just going to say a few words of welcome. Um, welcome to the 22 of you online. Thank you for waiting patiently. Sorry, um, it took us a, a few minutes to get started. Just uh, settling our incredible new technology that requires a little bit more careful handling than we're used to. Um, so this, it's really wonderful that this event is going ahead. A long time in the planning and many years of collaborative work in the background and today a chance to hear from some of those of you who've been um, doing that uh, over the years and more recently. So this is a, a long-standing collaboration between uh, the British School at Rome and the recently renamed Bill Nass, British Institute for Libyan and North African Studies, which was formerly the Society for Libyan Studies. This is a collaboration that has been, uh, been, been taken forward over many years, um, and today we're going to hear some, uh, some more recent outcomes. Um, and this uh, workshop's been funded by the British Academy, so I should thank them for their generous sponsorship. Um, we're going to hear a lot today about um, our collections um, across the BSR and Bill Nass, um, and this is part of a bigger drive which is being supported and funded by the British Academy to join the collections across all the BIRI, all the British International Research Institutes that the British Academy sponsors and, and supports. Um, through collaborations, through digitization projects, and through thinking across um, the connections, the very strong connections between our collections. Um, and BSR and Bill Nass have been leading the way in this work. Um, so it's exciting to hear from them this morning. Um, we're also going to hear um, in an extraordinary kind of moment, very uh, well-timed moment from Joyce Reynolds at a later point in the program. Um, uh, because this event is also in many ways a homage to her and to her legacy, and we'll have a chance to hear some amazing footage from an interview with her made shortly before her death later on in this morning's programme. Um, so it just leaves me to say welcome, thank you for being here, and um, to welcome Nicolas Mugnai, one of the organisers of today's event, together with um, Alessandra Jovenko, our archivist, and various others supporting them. Nicolas is the assistant director of Bill Nass, <laughs> it's a kind of beautiful acronym, but strange in the mouth still. <laughs> um, and he's going to be moderating this morning's proceedings. So welcome, Nicola. Thank you very much, Abby, for the kind introduction. And thanks to the BSR for hosting this event. It's great to be here in Rome uh, presenting this workshop, which as Abby said, is supposed to focus on these ongoing collaborations between the BSR and Bill Nass within the broader framework of the BIRI consortium. So that's really good. Um, so what we aim to do with this workshop is uh, to have a first session which looks more specifically at some of the work that has been done around the recent online re-edition of the inscriptions of Roman Tripolitania 2021. So we will have two talks uh, focusing on these topics. And then in the following uh, session, we will have a closer look at some of the archival collections, which have proved very useful for work uh, around uh, this topic. Uh, specifically the Bilna's archive, and then we will hear some of the ongoing work uh, by the University of Roma Tre and some of their partners in Libya around uh, the archive in Tripoli. Uh, so I'm really looking forward to these presentations and also, and maybe even more importantly, to the discussion that I would like to try and encourage as much as possible with our live audience here in Rome as well as the many people who are attending from remote. And please do ask questions and please do contribute to the discussion. And by using the usual Q&A function on Zoom that you should all be familiar with at this point after two years and more of pandemic. Um, so without further ado, I would uh, like to start uh, this workshop. So with the first presentation 
uh, on the inscriptions of Roman Tripolitania, an exercise in collaboration. We will have uh, a live presentation here in Rome by Dr. Caroline Barron, who's an assistant professor in classics at Durham University and who has been doing much work on the digitization of uh, inscriptions and has been working on uh, Libyan inscriptions in particular. And she will be joined by uh, Charlotte Roche from Remote, who is a uh, Bilna's honorary archivist and uh, emerita from uh, KCL. And so I would like to welcome uh, Caroline and Charlotte uh, to give this talk about the inscriptions of Roman Tripolitania. Is my screen being shared elsewhere? Uh. Thank you. Thank you very much to the BSR for hosting uh, this workshop today and to uh, Nicola and Bill Ness for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. I've been working on these inscriptions since 2008 when I joined Charlotte um, in the first digitization of the 1952 edition. Um, and so they've been an ongoing and long-standing uh, research interest of mine and it's a pleasure to be able to talk about them with you. Um, I'm going to talk for sort of 10 to 15 minutes and then I'm going to hand over to Charlotte online who will close our session. So between 1947 and 1952, John Ward Perkins and Joyce Reynolds, who was then based here at the BSR, and assisted by Richard Goodchild, worked in Libya collecting and recording antiquities, and in particular, inscriptions. The result was, of course, the 1952 publication, The Inscriptions of Roman Tripolitania, and you can see from its title page the extent of collaboration that existed from the very beginning. The volume contained 973 inscriptions, to which a further 23 were added in a supplement published by the papers of the British School at Rome in 1955. Although a remarkable publication for its time, inscriptions of Roman Tripolitania contained very little geographic information about the fine spots of the inscriptions, and only 30 plates of photographs, which did not do justice to the sheer number that Wall Perkins and Reynolds took, and which later became available for consultation at the BSR. In the early 2000s, work began at the BSR to make this full photographic record available online. And in 2008, the sort of first updated collaboration uh, became a partnership between the BSR and an international team who were planning to publish a digital edition of the entire 1952 publication, which was published online as the inscriptions of Roman Tripolitania 2009. Going digital meant that it was now possible for us to provide not only the full photographic record, but much richer geographical data that linked the inscriptions to maps and gazetteers and so to other resources. It also gave us greater functionality, such as free text searches and really rich indexing of the material. Now, in order to produce the digital edition, the inscriptions were encoded using Epidoc. And these are a set of guidelines and tools that are a subset of the Text Encoding Initiative's XML standard for the representation of text in digital form. I know I've lost approximately two thirds of you in that sentence, but stay with me. They are essentially a set of guidelines. It's a way of standardizing the way that we publish uh, information about the quality, the, the content of the edition of uh, the inscription online. It describes, or the guidelines describe the transcription and the editorial treatment of the texts, as well as, as, well as allowing us to encode uh, information about their material history. Now, these guidelines, which are a huge collaborative project in and of their own right, they have been created by a community of scholars uh, across the world who continue working as a community. Today, we update the Epidoc guidelines um, with some regularity. Um, they are based on the 1931 Leiden Conventions, another collaborative community 
that sought to establish a common set of symbols for describing the textual condition of an inscription. So for example, words that were abbreviated in the text, words that have been damaged but editors are able to restore, where letters may have become unclear on the stone. Epidoc has been developed to do exactly the same for the publication of digital editions of ancient documents, particularly inscriptions, but also papyri. And this is how we went about preparing the inscriptions for digital publication in 2009. Once we had done this in 2009, all of our material was then exported into EDH, the Epigraphic Database Heidelberg, um, which was also published using Epidoc, and where material that had been excavated or recorded in Tripolitania since the 1952 publication of IRT had also been added. And it started to become clear to us really quite quickly after the publication of IRT 2009 that the corpus was significantly bigger than our digitization of the 1952 volume and that so much more was possible. So it's a timeline of different uh, collaborations and involvements uh, as we reach uh, uh, the 2021 publication. The possibility of doing more became possible in 2017. Another platform became available. FS, or the Epidoc Front End Services, which is a delivery and browse search platform that can be set up and customized for individual Epidoc-based projects. What's important about FS is that it allows us to see the site as we're working on it. This wasn't possible in 2009. We were reliant on uh, the software uh, sort of performing as we hoped it would, but we couldn't see a finished product until the end. The FS platform allows us to share the site as it's in development, which meant that we could actually share what we were doing with other collaborators and colleagues um, and solicit expertise from those who aren't necessarily literate in Epidoc itself but who have crucial expertise on what the published edition looks or should look like. So with the development of this platform, Charlotte was further inspired to republish and enhance our digital edition of IRT so that it might exist not just as a volume of inscriptions, but as a repository of all currently published Latin, Greek, and Neo-Punic material from Tripolitania. And she received a grant for this in 2021 from the Society of Libyan Studies. By creating the new site using this FS platform, we were able to share it in its pilot form with our colleagues, many of whom are in the room today, um, and to invite their contributions to how the site should develop. So essentially, all of the inscriptions in IRT 2021 have been published elsewhere previously by a range of expert scholars, but they've been assembled and curated here by Charlotte Boucher, and we've received contributions, guidance, and support from many other colleagues across the world. The result is a much, much larger corpus of inscriptions. We now have 1,651 published inscriptions, though we expect that there are more recently published texts that may have escaped us due to the pandemic and which we will include in future digital editions um, of IRT. The site has vastly improved search functionality, largely due to a very rich system of indexing that allows our users to search by means of a much bigger range of categories. Now, one major addition to the corpus, uh, and this is my uh, personal mission, was the inclusion of the Neo-Punic texts from the multilingual inscriptions from Tripolitania. So there's a series of bilingual and trilingual inscriptions in Tripolitania which record versions of the same Latin and all Greek text and Neo-Punic. Uh, Neo-Punic is the spoken and written dialect of Punic that arose in Libya after the fall of Carthage in 146 BC. It's a phonetic script without vowel letters that differed from the earlier Punic language due to the dialectical changes that evolved as its use spread amongst the Berber people of North Africa following the Roman conquest. Uh, this is an example, IRT 318. You can, it's an octagonal monument that is inscribed in, on three sides, two sides in Latin, and then on the far left, you can see there the Neo-Punic um, sort of cursive script uh, inscribed. 
Now, Joyce Reynolds and John Ward Perkins had not recorded the Neo-Punic texts in the 1952 publication. They indicate where there are Neo-Punic texts present in bilingual or multilingual inscriptions, but they didn't engage with them otherwise, which is fair enough because very few scholars could engage with Neo-Punic script at this point in the 1950s. The understanding of Neo-Punic epigraphy was very much in its infancy. The 2009 edition of IRT was intended as a digital edition of the 1952 volume and the 1955 PBSR supplement. So the decision to not record the text of the Neo-Punic inscriptions there at the time seemed justified. But there was also a practical consideration. There is no Unicode script for Neo-Punic, so how we can represent the look of the script online. So it wasn't possible to represent it in its untransliterated form as per the, the stone. However, given the hundreds of new texts that we were adding to IRT 2021, enhancing it with inscriptions found and published since 1952, we decided to be brave and to add the Neo-Punic text to the multilingual inscriptions. They are, of course, part of the dialogue. But one of the issues we faced was that as a script, as a language, it's only partially transmitted. Punicists themselves are not agreed on all of the specificities of how the language works. And this is largely because Neo-Punic can often only be distinguished by a kind of morphosyntactic context, how the words are formed individually and how they relate to each other to give meaning, which we don't always have due to the relatively small number of Neo-Punic inscriptions that have survived. That said, lots of work had been done on the Neo-Punic inscription since 1952. Teams of Italian scholars had worked extensively on the texts, publishing the Iscrizione Puniche della Tripolitania in 1987, which provided readings, the majority of which are largely accepted today, and an extensive commentary. More recently, major work has been done by Carol Jongling and Robert Kerr, the latter of which, Bob Kerr, was a brilliantly enthusiastic collaborator in helping us work out how to represent these texts authoritatively in IRT 2021. Uh, and their two publications, the Handbook of the Neo-Punic Inscriptions uh, and Kerr's Late Punic Epigraphy, have added significantly to what we're able to say in IRT 2021 about these texts. Perhaps most importantly, and it's another boring practical consideration, in the last 20 years, the study of Neo-Punic has evolved so that their publication often prioritizes transliterating them into Latin script and publishing them with more standardized reasons than were previously available. There's less focus on attempting to represent visually the direction of the script, which should be read right to left, um, but one of the most crucial issues is that there are no conventions comparable with the Leiden uh, conventions that we use for Greek and Latin epigraphy, which has been problematic when symbols used by Leiden are already in use as linguistic markers in Neo-Punic. So for example, this uh, is how we've represented the addition of the text for IRT 318 um, uh, on the site. Uh, you can see part C is the transliterated Neo-Punic text underdots beneath certain letters in Neo-Punic represent a phonetic indication, whereas in the Leiden conventions, they represent an unclear letter. So we've had to work around how to communicate both of those things within the same publication in a way that isn't confusing to the reader. To get around this, we've had many conversations, both with Punic epigraphers uh, and each other. And we were able to follow some conventions established by the I Sicily project in Oxford for their Punic material, which has meant that these sort of conflicts uh, that exist uh, are at least uniform across our corpora. And it's worth saying here that adding the Neo-Punic material to the corpus was absolutely the right thing to do. As we've worked out how to encode their texts digitally and to lemmatize the vocabulary, we've had to get much more closely involved with understanding what the language was doing than we were initially prepared for. It's become clear that these Neo-Punic inscriptions from Tripolitania sit at the intersection of a really dynamic moment of linguistic development. 25 years ago, scholarship spoke of Neo-Punic as a corrupt Punic, a language on its last legs. 
But nothing could be further from the truth, and Bob Kerr's involvement in our publication of the material here has really um, highlighted that. He's really shown us that they're just using a different orthographic system. In the case of the bilingual and trilingual inscriptions from Tripolitania, we're seeing kind of a punification of Roman concepts, which are adopted into Punic civic culture in order to reflect the reality of living alongside Roman rule. So I'm going to hand over to Charlotte shortly. But IRT 2021 is not the final stage of our work on the inscriptions of Roman Tripolitania, not by any stretch of the imagination. We anticipate further digital editions with some regularity, perhaps not the regularity that Charlotte's hoping for, but some regularity. Uh, and they will be in, these uh, further editions will be enhanced by the inclusion of newly published material, updates to information regarding dating and find spots, as well as those texts that have inevitably escaped our detection in the IRT 2021 edition. And our first step with the next edition will be to try and correct some of those omissions. So the inscriptions of Roman Tripolitania have since the, the first incarnation of the volume been an exercise in collaboration. From Joyce Reynolds and John Wall Perkins recording of the material together to the BSR's careful curation and conservation of the photographs and the international team that developed the Epidoc guidelines that has made subsequent digital publication possible, it's clear that the continued success of IRT relies on collaboration being ongoing. So I'll end with a plea that we welcome interaction with users and researchers working on Libyan epigraphy as much as possible so that we can continue to improve and build upon this pretty amazing existing platform of work. So thank you very much. I'm going to hand over to Charlotte for her final words on the subject. Right. Well, I, I don't have so, so much to add. It's, it's a rich and exciting story, but in a way it starts with the front page of the first edition of IRT, when you see the number of names listed there. Because humanists, people in the humanities, don't have a tradition necessarily of collaboration. Archaeologists are used to working as teams, but humanities scholars have a model of themselves as the lone scholar producing the great work. And I think that the survival and success of our humanities is going to depend, among other things, on robust systems for collaboration. And the experience that we've had, particularly with, the, with IRT 2021, has shown that this is now practically possible. It's possible to share your work while you're doing it, the important change is going to be how you think about it. Are you happy to show somebody else something that you have written that is not yet complete, that is not yet perfect? Are you happy to admit your ignorance? And that's something we don't all find easy. But I was very lucky because I worked as a student and then as a collaborator with Joyce and we got into the habit of exchanging our information all the time, crossing out each one, crossing out what the other one had written, and then recrossing it out and sending it back to us and forwards like a tennis match. Um, as long as you're undertaking this in the right spirit, it's hugely helpful. And I would like people to take away a sense of the value of collaboration. The person who is going to help you you may not yet have met, but there's somebody out there who can explain that funny word in line five, if you can find that person. So I would say, and there's somebody in Libya who can tell you exactly where this find spot is. So I would say, let us use the new resources that we have to make our academic work available but also to join in building resources. So that's all I have to say, and good luck to the future.
So thank you very much, Caroline and Charlotte, for this comprehensive overview of the work around the inscriptions of Roman Tripolitania 2021. And now, uh, on a similar topic, I'd like to introduce the next talk, uh, From Paper to Digital, The Mechanics and Challenges of Modern Archiving, which is going to be a joint presentation by Alessandra Giovenco, who's the BSR archivist here in Rome, um, Roberta Cascino is a research fellow of the BSR, and Francesca Bigi from the Sovereintendenza Capitolina ai Beni Culturali. So, Alessandra, please come here. Thank you, Nicolò, and thank you, everybody, and especially all, all my colleagues. And uh, I, want, I wish also to um, welcome um, Professor Rafael Muran, who is the newly appointed BSR Head of Research Collections. Um, there are several documents preserved in the BSR Administrative Archive that can help us visualize the circumstances in which the inscriptions of Roman Tripolitania project took place in the late 1940s. This is a passage of a letter sent by John Bryan Ward Perkins, director of the BSR, to Hugh Last, renowned professor of ancient history at Oxford University and chair of the BSR Faculty of Archaeology, History and Letters, between 1946 and 1952. As you may have noticed, one of the main protagonists of this incredible enterprise is mentioned in the text, and it's Miss Joyce Mayer Reynolds, who died little more than a month ago. We shall hear more about Reynolds' experience in her own voice later. So getting ready for an expedition in North Africa would involve not only preparing first aid supplies for a long stay, but above all, caring for the provision of photographic materials deemed essential to the success of the enterprise. From the list on the left side, we may infer that the quantities of the negative film as well as photographic paper were quite large and that photographs were chemically developed in loco. Probably the negatives were placed into an enlarger given that the people involved were using 35 millimeter film rolls. The information that emerges from the archival documentation finds evidence in the way photographs and negatives in the War Perkins collection are assembled and presented. As far as the inscriptions of Roman Tripolitania project is concerned, a crucial outcome of such a huge endeavor are the nearly 1,200 photographic silver gelatin prints glued onto 284 cards which accompany the 1952 publication. Neatly arranged according to the numbers assigned to each inscription, the photographs provide users with visual evidence of what is accurately described in the text. As noted there, the majority of the photographs were held by the Antiquities Department at that time, Superintendenza alle Antichità e agli Scavi, and by the British School at Rome, respectively cited at, as SOPRE and BSR. Whilst we are sure about the dates of the BSR photographs taken between 1946 and 1953, and most of which have been inventoried by date by a 35 millimeter stripe number, we know very little about the chronological references of the images belonging to the antiquities department. These might be dated even earlier. It's no surprise that the way the inscriptions of Roman Tripolitania photographs are arranged 
and can be physically browsed in the archive, reflect an organizational practice which mirrors other series in the same archival collection. On the left of your screen, in fact, you see an example of Howard Perkins, with the help of his wife, Margaret, organized the pictures of the numerous photographic Libyan campaigns, while on the right-hand side, you can appreciate the arrangement of another pioneering survey conducted in Italy, in the South Etruria region, between the 1950s and the early 1970s. This family community-driven archival practice is one of the attributes that constitutes the visual identity of the BSR, at least for the period concerned with War Perkins' directorship. And I wish to thank Poppy Grima for the brilliant intuition in this regard. Going back to the inscriptions, when we started to discuss how we wanted this collection of photographs to be digitally represented and accessible online, we thought it appropriate to provide not only a description at item level, for example, the single photograph, but also to include the description as well as the image of the card in which each photograph had been glued. By presenting the archival context and the photo layout, our aim was to ensure that information about content and context was also provided to users, especially with regard to the original context of creation. It was important for us to allow online users to get a grasp of the work done by researchers in assembling the cards for the printed publication. And now I shall invite Roberta Cascino, who will talk a little bit about the behind the scenes aspect of the online publication. Roberta joined us at the initial stages one year ago, but learned very fast how complex these online projects can be. Roberta. Thank you. Um, before starting the cataloging process, we analyzed the structure of the archival uh, collection and its association with the printed publication. We immediately realized that it would have been essential for users to have access both to the individual items and their relevant card. We had to address various issues concerning the call numbers and the sorting of the photographs as well as, uh, well as uh, of the cards. Even, in the, if, um, even if publishing a collection online uh, seems to facilitate its browsing, in reality there are some negotiations to fulfill with that what uh, both uh, the system can do and the IT developers can offer. Sometimes if you ask for a technical change in order better to display a given collection, these uh, automatically extend to other collections that may not need that particular change. As an archaeologist and a researcher, I had the opportunity to look at these resources from another perspective. And now I understand better the complex um, work archivists and librarians do and the amount of research required to produce high quality metadata which must be consistent across other collections. There are so many considerations to bear in mind before starting such projects and careful planning is necessary if one of the aims of the project is to make a collection interoperable and linked open data compliant. Thank you. Thank you, Roberta. This is a behind the scenes, and Roberta helped us hugely at the initial stages of this project. So we are very grateful to Roberta for her work. Um, by looking at various examples from this collection, there are some observations we can make about questions these photographs may arouse. In this card, for example, you may see the same subject depicted by two different photographers. 
that is the same subject but addressed and approached differently. We do not know exactly who took the photograph, but we have assumed it was War Perkins here. The juxtaposition of both photographs and the context in which they have been placed can give us some hint about the differences between two archival collections. The photograph from the BSR is on the left, and that of the Superintendenza delle Antichità is on the right. So, BSR archival practice is juxtaposed with another approach to organizing and presenting a collection of images of the same artifacts. In some cases, the photographs from the superintendents, as we said before, were presumably taken before 1946. And as far as the chronological sequence of the photographs belonging to the BSR is concerned, what we understand from this card is that the 35 millimeter stripes were numbered with an identifier, you may see here, made up of the year of the photographic campaign, 47, the number of the role, usually expressed in Roman numerals, and the number of the shot in Arabic numerals. In this example, we can deduce that two shots were taken one after another, and perhaps on the same day. With such information, we could map chronologically the research itineraries undertaken in the Libyan territory. From this card, we derive additional information about photographs that apparently were not attributed either to the Superintendenza delle Antichità or to the BSR. If you see here, there is um, uh, three letters. There are three letters, RGG, which stands for Richard Goodchild. So by cross-referencing the information on the card with the text in the publication, we were able to identify a date and another and add Richard Goodchild to the list of people who played an important role in this common endeavor and also who took photographs during the Libyan campaign. The reasoning behind the cataloging that I shared with you earlier has found its digital translation on the BSR Digital Collections website. Thanks to a grant from the British Academy and a generous contribution from Bilnas through the encouragement of Professor Charlotte Rouchet, in 2021, we were able to work on the cataloging of this series and add metadata that link up to both the second digital edition of IRT, IRT 2021, and the Heritage of Libya Gazetteer. Three sets out of four have now been published on the BSR Digital Collection website and are available for consultation. The publication of the whole set will be completed at the end of 2022. Often, a single photograph may depict more than one inscription or piece of inscription, and therefore, browsing through physical objects, the photographs glued on cards and the paper publication, turns out to be a completely different experience from what readers and users can achieve by accessing the same items on a digital platform. For this reason, I'd like to comment further on this by citing John Schwartz, Canadian researcher and academic. Quote, within archives, photographs are encountered in a variety of physical and conceptual spaces, from the institution to the reference desk, from the finding aid to the box or folder, right down to the item in an album encapsulated in a mylar sleeve or dematerialized on a computer screen. In subtle but pervasive ways, each space, each register, mediates the photographic encounter and has the power to influence the writing of photography's histories." End quote. 
To conclude, this slide shows the association we have created between the photographs and the cards, which is useful to understand for a researcher. Earlier on, we mentioned two fantastic online resources that made it possible for us to create links through our photographic collection, the Libya Gazetteer and the second digital edition of IRT 2021. We are very grateful for these resources. We have immediately benefited from both of them, and we are sure that through this linking, our exposure on the web will be greatly enhanced. Work on places and people, according to the linked open data framework, will also be crucial in the near future in the light of the recently established collaboration with the other British international research institutes, which are laying the foundations of a common digital archive. Although our digital platform is not yet compliant with linked open data, what really matters is that these data and their URLs are embedded into each record and can be manipulated later. Thank you. <laughs> Francesca. Good morning, everybody. I apologize for my terrible voice. I hope I can make it to the end of the uh, presentation and uh, without too much coughing. Um, thank you very much for inviting me here today. Uh, thank you for the, to the British School and to the Bill Nuss, because um, um, to, to, to come here and tell this story of collaboration. Uh, some of you might have already heard this story because um, it was what I told in the uh, um, uh, IRT 2021 launch of the 5th of April, 4th of April. Uh, but with Alexand Alessandra Jovenko, we decided to uh, tell this story again because in the end, it's a story of collaboration, uh, even though it's only my side of the story. It can help uh, and serve um, to show how institutions can collaborate, but especially people can collaborate. Um, as Carolyn has reminded us, this collaboration started from the very beginning in 1952. Uh, in the inscriptions of Roman Tripolitania, in which uh, Joyce Reynolds and John Brian Will Perkins drew from the Italian archives. Uh, and it is stated in the word, in collaboration with, because knowledge previously held by the Italian archaeologists was passed and shared, uh, sometimes only in an oral uh, way, onto the uh, British scholars who took over the administration of the Department of Antiquities and of Libya. Uh, traces of this uh, drawing from the uh, uh, Soprintendenza archives can be systematically found in the entries of the inscriptions which were not previously published. Um, when in fine spot circumstances, uh, you can always read found, I don't know, in the Forum Vetus, and it says, Relazione Scavi, 1943-1930s. So it's actually the source of the information um, of Reynolds and Will Perkins are actually stated, and it is uh, the uh, paper archive of the Sovrintendenza. Um, skipping 50 uh, years, half a century, that's where my story begins in 2001, when I was a young student studying uh, architectural de decoration. It is good to remember that I am not an epigraphist, I'm an archeologist. Uh, and I was there studying my things and Ignacio Tantillo, who is sitting over there, first set foot in Lepchis for the first time to study, if I'm not mistaken, just one or two inscriptions, wasn't it? Uh, he, strangely enough, fell in love with the whole of the late antique inscriptions and soon decided 
to study them all. It's about 100 late antique texts. Um, he realized that being the inscription constantly engraved on earlier reused supports to give account only of the text would actually give only a partial picture uh, of this monument. And so we decided to join our competencies, our fields of expertise, and I would look at the physical evidence, the story of the stone, and he would tell the story written on the stone. Uh, this, uh, in turn, opened the way to a larger collaboration because inscriptions are, for their own nature, talkative uh, monuments. And these inscriptions told stories of wars, of money, economy, everyday civic life, uh, emperors. So it was uh, immediately uh, clear that we had to set these inscriptions within the broader picture. So the result was a book, uh, a work of collaboration of 10 people in which the focus are 95 inscriptions, but the picture is expanded and these ex uh, inscriptions are set within their topographical, archeological, economical, historical, uh, artistical background in an attempt to embrace uh, all possible fields. The book opened the way to a new series of collaboration. First arrived in 2012, the last statue of antiquity project, which uh, for myself was an immensely uh, instructive experience because uh, if the uh, physical output is a database online and a paper publication, the behind the scenes was really thrilling because there was a real sharing of knowledge, of data, discussion, uh, with the whole of the last touches of antiquity team. Um, and shortly after, uh, from 2013 to 2016, came the Eagle project. Again, another largely collaborative project, um, which involved more than 10 uh, international institutions, universities, and academies, like the British School, uh, and the idea was to create uh, um, a large platform in which all inscription from different databases could be uh, reversed into it uh, and accessible to the wider public, not only to scholars, but to students, curious men in the street. Uh, and the way to, to draw attention from the uh, man in the street was also to translate inscription. And that was my involvement uh, within the Eagle project, um, working alongside Alessandra and all the rest of the British School, uh, British School at Rome team uh, on translating inscription of Roman Tripolitanian from Latin into Italian. The English translation had already been done by Joyce Reynolds in the IET 2009 edition. Um, while we were working in the Eagle project, uh, as um, Caroline has just told us, in 2009 or 2008, I can't remember, the inscription already had been uh, reversed into the epigraphic database Heidelberg. Um, so the whole bulk of the IRT was already in there, uh, but we decided to update that 100 inscription which were the focus of our paper book with Ignazio in order to add uh, not only um, updated reading of the inscri inscriptions, uh, some of the images we had uh, provided in the book and some more information about the uh, actual stone uh, on which these inscriptions uh, were written. Uh, and again, Heidelberg uh, was another wonderful experience because working in the very nerve center of such a, a distinguished project as it is the database in Heidelberg was really perfectuous. Uh, with Francisca Ferraudi Grenet, who is together with Brigitte Graf, they, they were the um, head of the project, uh, we had uh, a very uh, useful collaboration. Um, so I really cherish those Heidelberg days. 
And that Heidelberg experience led to another Heidelberg experience, uh, because shortly after, um, Christian Witschel, a professor at Heidelberg of Roman history, uh, tried to um, have a pilot project, uh, and he wanted to create an interactive map of, again, always those 100 and late antique um, texts from Lepchis, based on, um, placed on a GIS um, map in which you could browse and navigate the map according to whatever uh, interest you had. You could search the map if you wanted to search by honor and or if you wanted to search by material, you could search by find spot uh, and you could actually see the spatial distribution of inscription within the cityscape or within a single context, uh, building context. Uh, so, uh, all these uh, experiences uh, and parts of this story which I've told actually go together with many more experiences into the inscriptions of Tripolitania, Roman Tripolitania 2001 and 21, uh, which is, uh, as Karen has told us, the uh, arrival point, but a starting point also for for new ventures, and uh, talking about new ventures, um, Alessandra uh, has asked me to uh, start this new collaboration, which is a storytelling based on IoT images, and the idea is to select uh, um, nice images, specific images, highlight images that can actually give the idea of how vast and different the collection of IoT pictures held within the BSR is uh, and try to tell, again, a story uh, behind each of these pictures. In, in this case, uh, IoT 232, uh, which is the um, dedicatory inscription of the um, Arch of Marco Aurelio and Lucio Vero in Tripoli, uh, was commented by Beatrice Pinnaca Boni, who uh, managed in a few lines to uh, tell the story of how this uh, beautiful marble arch, the first marble arch of Africa, was actually turned in the 17 and 1800s into grocery shops and a coal uh, cellar, and then in the early 19, um, 20th century into a picture house, and then how, after the Italian restoration work, it finally came uh, back to light again. Uh, whereas in the case of the, t the other two mosaic inscription, I decided to, I chose those ones because I really like the idea of this inscription set within uh, a very naive yet um, uh, um, straight to the point image, which is, depicts uh, a pair of sandals, an oil flask, a strigil, and the invitation to wash well once you get into the uh, uh, baths uh, uh, of Sabrata. So um, I'm looking forward to see what the uh, future will bring <laughs> in terms of collaboration. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Caroline, Charlotte, Alessandra, Roberta, and Francesca for your presentations. Um, I think that the IRT project is really an excellent example to show the importance of these collaborations between institutions and universities. So there is plenty of food for thought here. Uh, we do have some time now for a discussion around these topics, so I invite questions from our live audience and the audience uh, from remote. If you have any questions, please. Well, I'd like to start by saying something about the IRT 2021 uh, digital edition and really the importance of this project. Um, there are many reasons why it is so important to have this updated edition available online, uh, not least because it added uh, so many new inscriptions which had been published in other places, but these were added to a single corpus of inscriptions. 
And I completely agree with Caroline about the importance of the Neopunic. Uh, having the Neopunic text in a standardized format added to the corpus, it was such an improvement. And it is important for so many reasons. Also, we have to remember uh, the importance of the Neopunic script, uh, which was still visible at Lepkis, even when Latin took over. It is true that by the second century AD, Latin epigraphy became the standard form of uh, epigraphy on building dedications and so on in the city. But it is also true that the Neopunic did not disappear. It was still visible. Thinking, for instance, of inscriptions such as those of the theater of Lepkis Magna, uh, the Neopunic dedication on one of the two Tholoi of the market, which was still in place, or the dedication of the Temple of Rome and Augustus, the Neopunic text on the lintel of the Kella, or the, Neop or the bilingual stelae placed in front of the temple recording the paving of the Forum. So all of this was still very much visible um, in the city, even when uh, Latin took over as the main language for building dedications and other inscriptions. So it is really, really important. Um, does anyone have anything to... Yes, Emlyn. I, I have a... Oh, this is very loud. Um, <laughs> I have a question. Sorry for our tech people in the back. Can we turn this down? Um, I have a question for, I suppose, Caroline and Charlotte, but also for everyone else that spoke um, about, and it's an archaeological question, <laughs> um, about context. And we heard about uh, from Alessandra about how important archival context is and how that's getting um, tackled, uh, and also from Francesca about, about context, um, more, more of an archaeological context and, and how that's being approached. Um, and of course, uh, context is often also dealt with in these databases by using maps and embedding in GIS systems and stuff like that. But I, I was really keen to hear um, from you about perhaps the future of embedding archaeological context in these databases, um, especially now that, that we have so much contextual information, really granular contextual information, and how we can go about um, making that available uh, alongside all of these inscriptions um, on these databases? <laughs> it's a good question, Emlyn, um, and one that I've that many conversations with Nico already, with Francesca just this morning we were discussing. Uh, there's huge potential to improve the specificity of detail about it for the archaeological context of the find spots for the inscriptions. Uh, there's a lot of material available in archives and in uh, publications that uh, have emerged in the time since that we can add. And there is, of course, the Heritage Gazetteer of Libya, which is integrated into um, IRT 2021, but which there is the potential to do more with. I don't know if Charlotte wants to say something about the Heritage Gazetteer of Libya. Yes, just to say, this is something which grew organically from the fact that when we were working on Joyce's material, she recorded finds at a lot of places which we couldn't easily identify. She used the name and the transliteration that was told to her in 1950, um, or what she thought the person was saying, perhaps. So that some of her locations are very precise, and some of her locations, it's very difficult to know where they are. So we put all of these, um, Hafed Welder did a great job of locating a lot of these places. And we then put all of this material into the Heritage Gazetteer of Libya and added the material from Saranaika, constructed precisely with the hope that people will look at it and add further information. Oh, I know where that is. I know that name. If you go to the Heritage Gazetteer, you will see, firstly, that the toponyms vary enormously. Secondly, that we have very varying quality of, uh, of actual coordinates. So the coordinates as we have them are not necessarily definite. And thirdly, that if you search for the word check, you will get a list of all the places which are named 
in the Reynolds publications, but which we have not been able to identify. And it's very important to be prepared to tell people what you don't know. And the hope is that people, this is a resource which will gradually grow as people refine, contribute, add to the data. So that, that's a challenge to, everyone in this room knows something extra, and everybody knows more than I do. Thank you very much, Charlotte. Yeah. Are there any other questions? But well, I think it is really interesting to see uh, this relationship between the digital archive and the paper archive and all the work, the important work that has been done behind the scenes uh, with these archives and all the precious information that the study of these collections can reveal. So obviously I'm thinking of the DSR archive more specifically, but also um, other archives that can be used for these purposes. And I think it's important that we keep in mind that uh, this is an incredibly important uh, source of information. Uh, sometimes we've got plenty of materials still found in these archives that we need to investigate and they can provide important information for the advancement of archaeology and other projects. I think Alessandra would like to say yes, something about uh, that. Yes. Can you hear me? Can you hear yes. me? Yes. Okay. Um, uh, when I, um, during my presentation, I showed a couple of photographs, uh, the same shot of the same artifacts. And um, interestingly, we discussed that uh, with Francesca, and she told me uh, a story about um, this artifact. And I like Francesca to comment on that because it's, um, it gives you another perspective um, from uh, the photographic collection point of view. Um, Alessandra was talking, uh, actually in the past, we had been talking about dating the, inscript, the uh, photographs of the uh, Department of Antiquities. So the, the non-British photos, let's put it this way. Um, because we had uh, clues and we suspected that they were uh, depicted uh, a situation of um, um, an, an earlier situation. Uh, while we were discussing the Thank you. Okay. Oh, yes. Um, in one of Alessandra's slides, there is uh, the uh, large lintel um, with the dedicatory inscription of the theater. Uh, it's three copies of the same inscription, so there's plenty of pictures of that um, text. Uh, but one of them, I don't know if you can remember it, shows this block when it's still embedded in the earth. And it's partly uh, excavated and there is a, um, somebody trying to, to clear it from, from the sand and debris. And that image, uh, we are sure that it's, uh, it was shot definitely before the 1940s because we know that in the years 1937, 1948, uh, Giacomo Caputo undertook um, the excavation and restoration of the theater. And that image is particularly uh, precious because it depicts that piece of inscription in its uh, original, no, not original, in its fine, stop, in fine spot because it was reused in a portico behind the theater in the later times. And then Caputo took it out and put it back in place uh, in the theater where you can see it now and well. <clears throat> it was depicted in the later pictures. So we do have, if we cross-reference archaeology uh, and... It's that image over there. This one? You can see it. It's still... Uh, partially uh, under the sand, yes, the, the next one, yes. And there is 
somebody trying to clear it uh, from, the, from the sand to take it out. So that is uh, where the inscription was found, reused, and from where it was taken and then restored back in place. Uh, so we can, if we read through Giacomo Caputo's uh, diaries and publication, we can actually tell which year, in which year that picture was taken. So we can contribute to archive and archaeology in a, in a mutual way. That was just... Yes, absolutely. That's a very important point. So thank you very much for saying that. I think, can I just make one other point, just to say, one of the things we're demonstrating today is that when you see something which looks lovely and polished and perfect and you can press on all the buttons and it does what you want, there's all this work behind it. And we tend to not to show things until they're perfect, which of course they never are. And it's important to remember that all of this reflects an ongoing process of scholarship with the occasional snapshot but the scholarship goes on, the next product will be richer or different from the last one. This is a snapshot of work that is in motion and to which everybody is encouraged to contribute. Absolutely. I think we all agree on that. <laughs> we do. We, do. we, we aim at perfection, <laughs> but uh, we should publish stuff. <laughs> Okay, so I think we now have time for a short break, and we will reconvene at 10.50 Rome time and for the second session, and which will then be followed by a lovely interview with Joyce Reynolds that was recorded in July 2022. And then finally, last but absolutely not least, uh, a conclusion to this workshop, which will be kindly provided by uh, Professor David Mattingly, who's joining us today from remote uh, in Leicester. So, see you in a bit.
Okay, thank you very much everyone and welcome back. We're just waiting for a few last people to trickle back into the room. So we're going to recommence now with our second session um, before we finish for the day. And um, to kick us off now, uh, we've got Nicolo Munyai, who's going to be talking about the Bilnas Archive, uh, its history development, and the potential for new research. Nicolo, passing over to you. Thank you very much, Emeline, and welcome back, everyone. So what I'd like to do with my brief presentation is to give an overview of uh, the archive of Bilnas, uh, formerly known as the Society for Libyan Studies and now the British Institute for Libyan and Northern African Studies. Uh, talking a bit about the history of this archive, its development and the potential for new research. I think it is important because while there are some archives such as the BSR archive that are very well known and have been much used by scholars and researchers uh, on Libya and North Africa, perhaps the Bilnas archive is less known and I'd like to show you something about the potential of this uh, resource to raise awareness of its existence. So, what is the Bilnas Archive? The Bilnas Archive is a collection of documents, drawings, maps, and photographs, which were donated by individuals who uh, carried out archaeological research in Libya, mainly from the 1940s onwards. And I'm talking of well-known people such as John Bryan Ward Perkins, Barry Jones, Owen Brogan, Kathleen Kenyon, and many others. Uh, the Bilnas Archive, before it was known as the Bilnas Archive, was first established at the University of Newcastle in 1988, thanks to the initiative of a, a very important scholar, John Dore. Um, the archive is now housed at the University of Leicester, thanks to the initiative of David Mattingly, uh, who kindly provided this new space in order to secure the long-term preservation of these resources and also to connect it together with the materials from uh, other projects led by David himself on Libya and North Africa more broadly. The composition of the Bilnas archive is essentially the result of the materials that were donated by the individuals who did the research in Libya, and also how these people selected the materials that they wanted to donate uh, to the Bilnas archive. And it's important to point out that further collections were donated in very recent years to Bilnas, and more are still now in the process of being added and catalogued uh, as part of the archive. Uh, if you are interested to learn a bit more about the history of the archive and some of the projects that were related to the use of these resources, I don't have the time to explain everything today, but I would suggest that you have a look at these two short publications uh, which appeared in Libyan Studies recently, uh, the Society for Libyan Studies Archive, as it was still known at the time, past, present and future, and then history organization, recent and future development. So please have a look at this. So when the archive, the physical archive was moved to the University of Leicester, uh, some priorities were identified of the work that needed to be done on these collections. In particular, I'm talking of the storage of these materials, the preservation, a full comprehensive cataloging in order to, of course, uh, enhance accessibility and also, last but not least, the development of uh, digitization plans. So these tasks were undertaken by professional archivists and I'd very much like to thank Bilnas for the efforts in employing these archivists and also 
the important support that was provided by archive staff at Leicester. And so these archivists who did work with the Bilna's archive, I'd like to mention Leanne Harrington, Sarah Wood, Jane Selleck, and our current Bilna's archive, Felicity Crow, who is uh, joining us today from remote, from Leicester in her office. And I'd like to thank Felicity for the excellent work that she's doing with these collections right now. Um, advice on the development of these digital strategies comes from Charlotte Rocher in her role as Bilna's honorary archivist, and also support to the work of the archivists has been provided by the John Doerr scholars, by Bilna's. I had the pleasure of um, holding this role from 2012 to 2017. And now Ahmed Bouzayan, who's also with us today, uh, is holding this position. And I'd, li I'd like to thank Ahmed for the wonderful job he's doing with the archive, and in particular, uh, even during a very difficult period, such as that of the pandemic, uh, the amount of work that he has been doing, which includes the scanning, digitization of images, and also, even more importantly, um, the identification of sites that he was able to do and adding the metadata to the scans of these images. So it's really, really important work. So uh, if you look at the website of Bilnas, www.bilnas.org, you will find some information on the Bilnas archive. And uh, at the bottom, you will have links the first one uh, linking to the online archive and the second one to the catalog of the physical collections in Leicester. Uh, so if you click here, this link will redirect you to the catalog of the archive, which is hosted on this platform by the University of Leicester and the Library at Leicester, um, which is quite straightforward. So this is accessible to everyone. You don't need to log in or anything. Uh, so the cataloging follows this system, the identification of the fonts with the letter D and then a number D1 through to D, I think 53 we reached by now, something like that. And then if you click on each font, then you will scroll down and have more detail about the hierarchy. So for instance, D5 here. Uh, which is the papers of Kathleen Kenyon and John Ward Perkins, especially their excavations at Sabrata, you will then find the sub fonts here. And then again, if you click on one of these individual uh, sub fonts, you will find a description of the physical materials that are located at Leicester. And these will give you some information on uh, materials that might be of interest for your research. This as far as it concerns the physical archive. Now, it is also important that we, as builders, are, development, are developing a digital strategy. So the link that you saw on the slide before to the online archive will redirect you to the Heritage Gazetteer of Libya, which was mentioned in some of the previous presentations. And this is how we envisage to connect uh, the online archive once these materials have been digitized and made available online with this direct connection to the Heritage Gazetteer of Libya. And here you can see some examples of what you will see. All of this is supposed in the near future to uh, contribute to larger uh, projects. And I'm thinking in particular of uh, these uh, archive digitization plans carried out as part of the BRIS, the British International Research Institutes, under the sponsorship of the British Academy. And also, even beyond that, to connect it to broader projects. I'm thinking in particular of Nahan, and so all of these collaborations with other partners and institutions. So this is the step for the near future. So the Vilnius Archive and the Archaeological Heritage of Libya, uh, it's a record of the research done in this country, and the archive includes both published and unpublished materials. 
also important because these materials document the state of monuments before damage was done or threats to, local to the local archaeological heritage. Looking, for instance, at this one, this picture, which comes from the Charles Daniels Papers collection, showing the state of the excavated structures on the east side of the old Forum of Lepkis Magna and the state of those uh, ruins at the time. Um, so these collections encompass many aspects of these ex uh, expeditions to Libya. And these are not just useful for archaeological research, but they're also relevant to Libya's past and modern history, anthropology, ethnography, geography, literature, among many other subjects. And indeed, it's not just uh, the archaeological aspect that we'd like to emphasize, but also how these materials can be used for broader studies. Uh, for instance, if you take a look at some of these shots that were taken at the time of the excavations of the Forum of Sabratha, they do provide information, of course, about the excavations, and these have obviously been used for publications already, but they also reveal a lot of interesting information about the rest of the work that was done during uh, these excavations, and um, so the dynamics, so for instance, uh, uh, photographs of archaeologists and local workers during the excavations and the study of the materials, so they have an interesting story to tell which goes beyond uh, the mere archaeological investigation. And same, for instance, with materials taken from the Owen Brogan collection, how wonderful, how incredible it was uh, back in the 1960s for someone like Owen Brogan to travel across the pre-desert of Tripolitania and everything that was involved in those expeditions. And then also, Speaking from the Bilna's perspective, the archive also includes materials about uh, the origins of Bilna. So, for instance, documents related to the foundation of what was known back in 1969 as the Libya Exploration Society. So, just to give you some examples. So, many of these materials have already been used for publication purposes in the past together with the use of collections from other institutions, and obviously, uh, in particular, I'm thinking of the BSR archives, so no need to mention uh, studies such as Girza, Libyan settlement in the Roman period, the excavations at Sabrata, or the Severan buildings of Lepkis Magna. All of these crucial publications that we all, we all know about made use of these materials. Um, so we'd really like to encourage uh, UK and international scholars, especially scholars for Libya, to make use of these resources. And a series of recent projects have much benefited from access of these materials in order to complement data sets of information that were collected during archaeological fieldwork in Libya. So I can uh, point out the series of the archaeology of Fazan volumes, uh, by David Mattingly, so which combine uh, David's uh, archaeological fieldwork down in Fazan together with fieldwork which was done previously by Charles Daniels. And so this really shows how important it is to combine different sources of information. So the materials that we recover during excavations together with the materials that have been left in archival collections. And then, again, materials from the Bilna's archives were used, for instance, by uh, recent uh, uh, by scholars who did their PhD research at Leicester, for example. I'm thinking in particular of my friend and colleague Julia Nicolaus, who did this very important study of the uh, ornamentation of mausolea in the pre-desert, uh, which uh, made use of these resources. And you have, if you're interested, uh, she published one paper here, Beyond Gerza, Roman period Mosley and Tripolitania, in these volumes that uh, we co-edited together, the Africa Romaque, Merging Cultures Across North Africa. Uh, the Bilna's archive was also important for developing a series of workshops, in particular two workshops uh, held at the British Academy in London and the New Walk Museum uh, in Leicester about the importance of Libyan antiquities and the threats 
to the uh, archaeological and cultural heritage of Libya uh, in very recent times. And so these materials were really useful to start uh, a conversation uh, among uh, stakeholders from different institutions. And uh, you see here lots of names of the people who contributed to the workshops and also to the essays and the proceedings, which were collected in Libyan Studies 48 um, around this topic. So anyone who's interested can have a look at, at this and see the work that has been done, not just with the Vilna's archive, but other work. And I'm thinking of important projects such as the Iamina project, the Endangered, Endangered Archaeology of the Middle East and North Africa, just to cite one example. And a very recent example of a publication that came out uh, very recently in 2021, uh, this book by Nicole Sheldrick, Building the Countryside, Rural Architecture and Settlement in Tripolitania during the Roman and Late Antique Periods. It's a study that brings together data on over 2,000 rural structures from Tripolitania, ranging in date from the 1st century BC through to the 7th century AD. And it represents a synthesis and re-examination of both published and archival data, in particular, the data collected during the UNESCO Libyan Valleys survey, together with new investigation through the use of remote surveys and the use of satellite imagery. And this is really important because it shows how these collections can contribute to broader studies, and in particular, the ULDS collections are currently being added to the existing collections of the Bilna's archive. So this is very much a work in progress. And again, thanks to Felicity uh, for her wonderful uh, work on the cataloging of these collections. And this work uh, is meant to be completed by the first quarter of 2023. So to sum up, uh, present and future of the Bilna's archive, uh, the completion of the cataloging of the physical collections is obviously one of our priorities for the present, and obviously to ensure the long-term preservation of these materials. It's also really important for us, for builders and for our partners, to raise awareness of the existence of these resources in the archive and to encourage scholars from all over the world to try and make use of these collections for the research. We really want this to be as open and as accessible as possible. And then to try and involve a range of stakeholders, especially from Libya, in an ongoing discussion about the development of these resources, and in particular, the implementation of digitization plans of the Bilna's archive, and a series of networking and links within the BIRI consortium to start with, but then also other projects and partners such as Nahan and beyond. So thank you very much for your attention. And now uh, I'd like to move to the next presentation. Uh, which will be delivered by Dr. Andrea Zocchi from the University of Roma 3 team that needs no introduction for the importance of the work that they have been doing uh, in Libya uh, from an archaeological perspective. So this talk today uh, is titled A Collaborative Project, Reorganization, Cataloging and Study of the Architectural Drawings of the Maps and Drawings Office of the Department of Antiquities of Libya, Tripoli, state of the research and potential for interaction with other archives and institutions. So please, Andrea, tell us everything about this. Non è la slide. Si aspetta come si va avanti. Ecco qua. Ok, grazie. Ok, good morning. And before starting my talk, I would like to thank, first of all, the British School at Rome that is hosting this important workshop. And 
I would like also to thank my friend Nicolò Mugnai, who invited the Roman Triarchaeological Mission uh, to participate in this event and sharing with all the colleagues our knowledge. So before starting, um, I, I would like to, to just introduce the, the project. Um, that the project that I will present now includes uh, the reorganization, cataloging, cataloging and study of the architectural drawings of the map and drawing office uh, of the Department of Antiquities of Libya, located at the Red Castle, Castello Rosso, in Tripoli. This partnership project was signed in 2016 with, with the Department of Antiquities through its director, Mohamed Al-Fallos, and with the participation of the National Oil Company. The editors of this project are Professor uh, Luisa Musso, Ferial Sherfeddin, responsible of uh, the technical department and head of the cartographic office, and Mohamed Al-Fallos. Many professionals participate, from the DOA, uh, Ferial Sherfeddin, Fatma Bagni, and Susar Abrugara, and from uh, University of Roma Tre Meda Foundation, Matthias Bruno, Fabio Chiret, Fulvia Bianchi, Nicolò Masturzo, and myself. Uh, we are currently trying, with many efforts, to collaborate and eventually integrate our data with the Macerata University Archive, that is the Centro di Documentazione Ricerca sull'Archeologia dell'Africa Settentrionale Antonino di Vita. Since a good percentage of drawings preserved at the Castello Rosso drawing office are copies and the originals are often stored at the Macerata Archive. The main task of the project are the reorganization and the physical rearrangement of the cartographic and drawings archive, facing first of all issues related to the, ma to, to the management and preservation of the documents. That means protect and at the same time make accessible the archive. For this purpose, a restoration office financed by a National Oil Comp Company has been created. But why talking of the project in this workshop? essentially for two reasons. The first is to sh showing the importance, the consistency, and the potential of the documentation stored at the Maps and Drawing Office. And second, the added value of these documents, above all, if related with the documentation of other archives, the BSR archives and the Bilnas archives. The map and drawing archive of the Red Castle in Tripoli stored more or less 2,700 documents dated between the 20s and the 70s of the last century. These decades comprised the activities of the Sovereintendenza Scavi e Monumenti della Tripolitania, then became Libya, and followed by the activities of the Department of Archaeology of Libya from 1951 onwards. Up to now, 638 documents had been digitalized, examined, and cataloged. These hundreds of documents belong to Leptis Magna. More or less the same number can be also referred to Sabrata, then Tripoli, and we have also hundreds of documents referred to other centers uh, of uh, Tripolitania. And uh, this documentation includes mainly technical drawings, that means plans, section, architectural details, but also cartographies, reconstruction and views of ancient structures, project of new buildings of, uh, of the archaeological area of Leptismania. The main authors of this documentation are, in chronological order, Luigi Turba, Diego Vincifori, and Carmelo Catanuso. In addition to these three authors, there is a number of drawings made by their collabor collaborators and students. A great absence have been reported, that is Giovanni Ioppolo, who was in Leptis, especially during the 70s. This absence can be explained considering that the archaeological context he, he worked, that are the old forum, Severan Arch, and the so-called Scavi Nuovi area, are still unpublished. And that, and that these productions have been 
often moved to Italy. The, pro the project of digitalization of the documents implies their autoptic examination. This allows us to gain information related to their state of preservation and to check with accuracy measurements and scales. Moreover, further details, notes and sketches made by the authors on the drawings have been reported. The form compiled for each document follows international standards, in particular those suggested by the Istituto Centrale per il Catalogo e la Documentazione. The form comprises general information such as title, author, date, and a second body of data are the technical information such as techniques used, support, and if it's the, the drawing is an original or it's just a copy, or, and, and so on. The lastly, descriptive uh, strings um, um, have been created, like the general description of the drawings and the state of preservation. This information will constitute the backbone of a proper catalog that will be pu published as a volume, the first one related uh, um, on Leptis Magna, in the Monografie dei Quaderni di Archeologia della Libia. Now I would like to uh, present some document preserved at the Tripolis uh, Drawing Archive, just to give you an idea of the material. A significant section is the one related to the cartography. The maps of Leptis Magna are various, and they go from the well-known cartographies of, an of the ancient city made in 1915 by the topographers Gruppelli and Alessandrini, used as a base on which, in the subsequent years, the personnel of the superintendents and superintendents after are noted new excavation and discoveries. Um, we have also different projects, uh, such as the one of the, of the buildings for prisoners employed in the excavation, for instance, in, uh, in the right, uh, top right, and uh, another one that showed the hypothesis of a tour of the city uh, that should be done with a decaville, for instance. This is just some, some example. Other unpublished maps are preserved at the drawing archives. For instance, a map dated at the end of 1946 showing the division of Regiones and Insule of Lepcis, and another one in which are comprises the excavation undertaken by Renato Bartocini in the Severan Harbour and partially along the Via Colonnata. This is just one of, uh, uh, of these maps. Among all the Lepcis Magna drawing preserved at the archive, the theater constitutes one of the most representative monumental contexts. The excavation of these buildings began during the 30s under the supervision of Giacomo Guidi and continued with Giacomo Caputo until 1951. Diego Vincifori was the first author to realize a series of drawings followed by those realized between the 40s and the 50s by Carmelo Catanuso. The majority of these drawings have been published by Caputo in, the late, in a late publication in, dated 1987, edited by Antonino Di Vita. However, the whole collection, including numerous unpublished documents, are, preserv are preserved in the Tripolis archives. The case of the, the theater is real clear in showing the difference of the two main designers who worked for the superintendency between the late 20s and the late 40s. There are Diego Vincifori and Carmelo Catanuso. The drawings of Vincifori, like this one, and we will see in future documents, clearly indicate his great ability with the, with the technical designs, his great attention to details, and the wise use of the background colors applied to indicate a, soft, a sort of structural stratigraphy. The production of uh, Carmelo Catanuso shows his more realistic, um, artistic hand in, in a way, probably less accurate to present details and measurements compared to Vincifori, but with a higher visual impact due to his heavier hand and due to the use of background colors marked sometimes even to different, differentiate the soil and, and the ground. A 
Among the documentation of the theater, particularly significant are the unpublished documents related to the Punic necropolis. Here there is a very interesting cross-section of the tombs found beneath the stage. There are mm, dozens of these, these uh, um, plans and sections that have been not published. Another area that I would like to take as an example is the old forum. In this case, the amount of documents is not very high. However, some of them are very interesting, like this plan dated 1935, made by Virgilio Franceschi. In the drawing were written in pencil some letter to indicate the hypothesis of the function and dedication of some buildings. These letters were subsequently partially corrected with new notes written this time in red and blue. This correction cannot be dated with accuracy, but for instance, the Basilica of Etus was not still identified and generically, and generically named with, the, with Atrio. Other documents related to the old forum and the Basilica of Etus in particular are stratigraphic section and plans made by the late 40s, uh, made in the late 40s by Carmelo Catanuso in collaboration this time with the, with the English uh, archaeologists. A further significant monumental complex deeply studied and drawn is the Severan complex. In the Tripoli archives, it stored the majority of the drawings related to the Severan, to the Severan Forum and to Basilica, produced between the 20s and the 40s. There are several plans. The first one is the one made by Luigi Turba, followed by the one realized ten, more or less 10 years later by Diego Vincifori surely more detailed and which highlighted the structure still standing and the ones built in the late antique period. Vincifori focuses also on the architectural details of the buildings, this is just an example, showing again his great ability in the technical drawing and his accuracy in the measurements. The colonnaded street and the Great Nymphaeum were excavated since the mid-20s and last, lasted for all the Italian colonial period. Also in this case, plans and prospectuses and architectural details were made. I would like, in this case, just to show you as an example, a plan made always by Diego Vinci Foring during the 30s, showing beside the several buildings all the late antique and subsequent structures that were removed by the excavations. These particular documents, this is not the only one, it's just an example, are fundamental to better understand those faces of the city that can be hardly known in other way and that are often unpublished. For instance, in the, these late structures are not reported in the War Perkins design collected by, by Robert Cronenberg in the, in the book Several Buildings of Leftist Mania. The main basilica has even more documents. During the first period of extensive excavations were produced interesting drawings of the monuments. Beside the detailed prospectuses and a plane made by Luigi Turba, there are several designs made by the engineer Renato Gerardi, at that time a valid field collaborator of, of Renato Bartoccini. These first graphic documents are part, particularly significant, oh sorry, because they can be related with the contemporary excavation daily reports preserved at the Macerata University and actually under examination by our team. A few years later, Diego Vincifori produced detailed plans, section and prospectuses provided with architectural de details. His great attention in offering the reader all the information and as much details as possible is clearly visible in the sketch of the plan of the baptistery of the main basilica here. In this case, in the bottom part of the, of the uh, sheet, left, left drawing, uh, he gave instruction to his collaborator Pasquale Sorano, who was in charge of the plan. Vinci Fori wanted to be sure Sorano would have taken measures and distances in the most accurate ways and using the appropriate tools in drawing it. Here, 
on the right is the definitive plan. Another drawing I would like to show you is a plan of the basilica made always by Vinci Fori. Here, the most remarkable, remarkable feature is the large amount of notes written by Vinci Fori himself or by one of his collaborators. Documents like this one are a precious source of information to reconstruct the work made on the field and the thoughts of the archaeologists, architects that works there in those years. During the 30s and especially during the excavation of the Basilica, Vincifori made also several plans and view showing collapses and a large quantity and the large quantity of architectural elements fallen down on the ground. In the Basilica, Car Carmelo Catanuso worked in the late 40s until 1951, making further plans and prospectuses, and he collaborated with the English archaeologists that from 1943 were in Leptis. This year said to be characterized by a spirit of active collaboration between the new English administration and the Italian arch architects archaeologists. In the introduction of the book, um, in the milestone book, The Severan Building of Leptis Magna, um, the, uh, by Ward Perkins, Philip Carrick wrote, where possible, he, Ward Perkins, encouraged the previous Italian excavators to complete the projects they had undertaken. And the acknowledgement made to him in various subsequent publications suggests that this collaboration was accompanied by real warmth and was not just formal. But most extensive excavation had been carried out by the late Guidi, and here was a real problem resulting from the severe paucity of any kind of record. In this circumstance, a crucial source of information lay in the architectural drawings prepared over the years by Diego Vincifori and by Carmelo Catanuso, who went to assist Ward Perkins directly. He would have wished to pay tribute to this architect as to his own team for contributing to the basis of a full description of the several monuments in this remarkable city. This word sounds really appropriate to underline today the importance and amount of data that is hidden in our archives. F firstly, the Castello Rosso, but also the BSR and the Bildnas archives. Their heritage, in this case related to Leptismania, are the results of years and years of excavation and researches, often showing different approaches, but surely characterized by an extraordinary documentary importance. At Leptis, the Italian colonial era excavation had, had probably different aims and made use of different techniques compared to the British investigation and surveys. Let's think, for, for instance, at, at the different use of the stratigraphics method and the the different use of photographs in archaeology. So just two, three decades, but made the, the difference at the time. The added value of the survey and study of the drawings of the Tripolis archives is doubtless the potential it may have, considering the documents stored at the Bilnas archives, for instance. Many monuments at Leptis, in this case, can be reconsidering can be reconsidered, taking into account the whole graphic documentation available from the beginning of the Italian investigation through the studies and researches made, made after sec the Second World War. The same potential could come out taking into account the drawings, the numerous drawings related to the inscription preserved at the Tripolis archive if compared to the documentation stored at the British School Photographic Archives, for instance. So, reconsidering the historical documentation of Tripolitania preserved in different archives in Libya, Italy, UK, and elsewhere, as a whole, is, in our opinion, the real target and a valid and freightful progress in knowledge. So, thank you. Thank you very much to Andrea for his presentation, to myself for mine. <laughs>
Um, right, so now we have time for some discussion around these topics uh, dealing with the importance of archives and how they can complement uh, information from archaeological fieldwork in Libya. So if there are any questions or comments by the audience, in person or, or remote, please, the floor is open. Lisa, yes. Do we have a microphone for Lisa? <laughs> I want to thank Niccolo for the shout out for Nahan and elaborate uh, a minute. But I also want to thank Andrea for this extraordinary project. It's so great and those pictures are so wonderful. The Dinamica del Crollo is something that, you know, I won't forget. Um, so Nahan is a project that started in 2015 um, and both Bilnas and the BSR are signatories. The among the original signatories to it. It unites about 20 institutions in the wish to create a common platform for archaeological archives dealing with North Africa. It went through a long period of stasis while the DAI did not produce the platform. And then it moved to the Ecole Nationale Supérieure in Paris, where it is actually underway and people are working. And we have things like a new homepage and this sort of thing. So I'm hoping that in the late spring, we'll have a major meeting again to refound the project with an actual platform for, um, for archives of all sorts. I wondered about the project of the Roma Trey. Um, have you got plans to put them online? So we, um, uh, until now, we worked on on in, in Tripoli, and we the, the great effort was to take out all these drawings and make measurements, and you know and restore all these drawings because um, sometimes it was very, some, sometimes many drawings were very in very bad condition. So, but th this was the first step. So we are still in the, in, at the end of the first step and we, of course, we are um, studying them. Of course, um, the next steps will be to make accessible all this documentation. And uh, one way is the, to, to publish uh, a catalog, and we are thinking also to put on online all this documentation. But I, I cannot. I mean, we are working on 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 this, so there is no. Um, um, it, it will be not done in in the in the next future. But we are thinking about because we will we'll be. Of course, we, it's the future, so we 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 have to to find a way. But, we are working with the with the department on, on of antiquities on, on this, but of course, when we have all the all the documentation done, we will be ready to to do this this step. Okay. Well, absolutely. I think that the first step being the preservation of the materials is uh, the obvious starting point, and it's also something that we had to deal with the Bilna's archive when the collections were moved from Newcastle to Leicester uh, to restore some of these materials, provide a proper archival storage for them. So that is really the first step. Uh, and then that eventually, hopefully, will lead to uh, a, um, an enhanced accessibility and hopefully uh, an online accessibility as well. And I'd like to thank Lisa for the update on Nahan and what, what's going on uh, with the project at the moment. So we are really looking forward uh, uh, to the next step. And please, Lisa, do keep us posted on this. It is really important. I think Alessandra would like to say something. Yes, I, I wanted to say that, um, so it's, um, it's maybe this is a good occasion to start to talk again with Lisa to, 
start again a conversation that was interrupted um, during the pandemic, obviously, and also I think to look at what we have in terms of plans and maps um, relating to leptismania in our archive. So it's uh, it's a very interesting, um, you know, development. And um, so I was wondering, Andrea, because but already Nicolò has mentioned that the conservation issues that you. Uh, I suppose, are having with those maps and drawings in Libya. Um, do you have any plans or are you in contact with conservators or people that can help you um, setting up a plan with, about conservation of uh, those beautiful drawings and maps? So the, um, the project, of course, is, uh, is uh, uh, ongoing. So we are, uh, currently we are restoring them. There are proper restorators and so they are working on them. So sometimes it was also hard to open them. So in, you can imagine that, that the, 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 there are different stage of preservation. So, so, um, so we, are, we, we are working on, on, on they are working. Currently, they are working on restore them. Of course, pandemic, the unstable situation, you know, in Libya. So uh, there are some difficulties in those years. Have been some difficulties, but we we are we are keep we are going on. We are keep going on. Yes. Yes, and also the, the, the DOA is doing a great work, a great job in this because they, they, they notice that they have a great potential. Of course, they already know, but now uh, with this new project, they, they are taking an uh, effective part of this, this project. So we are, we are really happy of this collaboration and we, of course, are looking for also collaboration in in in, uh, in Europe and you know, with other archives, of course. Absolutely, collaboration is the key word. <laughs> and I'd like to thank Andrea for showing that uh, slide with a map of uh, the part of the colonnaded street of Lepkis Magna, uh, where the Great Nymphium was located, showing the late antique development of the city, uh, which is something that is really important because unfortunately, we all know that in past excavations, not much attention was paid to the late antique and later phases of cities, while the focus was mainly on the Roman imperial phases. So it's really important that at least we've got that kind of documentation available. I was just wondering, so you mentioned that you have uh, more materials showing the late antique phases. What kind of materials do you have from which part of the city? So, um, mainly, mainly uh, the, um, all this, the, Sever the Severan complex. So the, the area of the Forum uh, Severianum and, uh, and uh, mainly the, the Severan Forum, but also the one, one important thing is, uh, is to, because not, not always is the drawing is, is clear in, in, mm. in terms of uh, stratigraphic uh, uh, methods, because sometimes right. uh, in, during the 30s, you know, there, there, are, there are general plans with, okay, they are indicate different walls, but a, help, a very helpful hand is looking at the uh, excavation daily reports made mm. uh, weekly. So if you compare the date of these drawings to the excavation daily reports, you can really construct the phase of, uh, uh, of the excavation and the phase of the building, of course, you, if you are lucky. But 
merging together these this different data, it's, uh, it's, it's the real potential. So, of course, but it's, it's a lot of work because uh, uh, you have to, 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 to understand the, the excavation reports and yeah. the match with the, with, the, with the drawings, if they match, of sure. course. <laughs> yeah. You always have to combine together different types of data Mm -hmm. But we know how important was, for instance, the plan of the Byzantine and the late antique phase of, uh, built uh, uh, in the theater, for instance. Yes. Yes. But you can imagine <laughs> if we, we have other data related to other different different uh, um, areas, such the, also the Severan Harbour uh, for the Islamic period, for instance, late antique Islamic period. No, absolutely. I, I'm just talking uh, for free, um, <laughs> sure, freely, sure, but just sure, sure. to to make some examples. This is really important. And I think also uh, we have to consider the issue of the movement of materials in the late antique and later phases as well. Thinking, for instance, of the inscriptions. Uh, for example, some recently published studies, such as an inscription which for a long time was thought to belong to a Flavian arch of uh, unknown identification that in the very recent study on the Curia of Lepkis Magna was potentially attributed to the facade of the building. Um, so, and that shows how uh, these, these materials moved because the inscription itself was found quite far away from the Curia. And also I can mention some elements of architectural ornamentation such as the uh, decorated cornices which were re-employed in the church of the old forum. Uh, for a long time, these were thought to belong to a building underneath the church, but actually uh, recent studies on the Arch of Trajan, they confirmed that those cornices come from the Arch of Trajan, which I think lies some 400 meters away from that fine spot in the forum. So these are all issues we have to keep in mind, how materials were moved in antiquity. And this kind of documentation can provide at least some additional information uh, for us to understand these later phases, which are Absolutely. as important as the previous phases. Does anyone have any other questions? Also, I don't know if there are any, any questions from the online audience. No, there are no, okay. <laughs> Thanks for that. Uh, well, in which case, I think we can now proceed with the next bit. So I'd like uh, Emeline to come here. Yes, so before we move on um, to David to wrap up today's workshop, um, figuring out where my mouse is, um, we're very, very lucky to be able to share this next um, small section of the program with you all um, and, and to those online as well. Um, and in particular, knowing where we are now, we're even luckier to have uh, this next portion of the program. We've already heard um, from Caroline and from various others about the incredible legacy that Joyce Reynolds left uh, in her wake, centered not only around her work in North Africa, but also elsewhere in the Mediterranean from groundbreaking uh, research between Aphrodisias and Rome, uh, innovative use of published texts in translation, and, and of course, um, something that we'll hear about, a woman who broke countless gender norms, um, paving the way for so many brilliant um, female scholars to follow in her path. And of course, these memories remain strong in her mind, as we will hear shortly. And just before she passed away, um, just over a month ago, our former chair of faculty here at the BSR, Rosamond McKittrick, spent some time talking with Joyce in her home. Um, and this conversation, to me at least, uh, vividly illuminates her time here at the BSR post-war, in this immediate post-war era, when Joyce had just arrived in Rome um, and shed some really beautiful light on her character uh, and her humour and her incredible legacy. So I'll play this, this brief interview uh, and conversation between Rosamond and Joyce now um, before David wraps up um, our workshop today. There was a... You might Three need to turn journey, the as far as volume up, I think, for those in the back. Back 
across Europe to get to the school. <laughs> Gosh. <laughs> I had been to Rome before, so I had some idea, but no idea about the school. I had some idea of what the place was like. And, uh, oh dear, I remember arriving. I'll start again once we've got the volume issue sorted. <laughs> And rushing there off to go. find okay. a text. Let's let's try again with volume. There was a three-day journey, as far as I remember, across Europe to get to the school. <laughs> Gosh. <laughs> I had been to Rome before. So I had some idea, but no idea about the school. I had some idea of what the place was like. And, uh, oh dear, I remember arriving after this three-day journey <coughs> and rushing off to find a taxi. And I got a taxi. I was frankly proud of myself. <laughs> I got a taxi, uh, and we went across Rome, but I had never been to the school. So when we arrived at this place with those enormous stairs, <laughs> I thought, this can't be for me. <laughs> and I went in by the staff entry. Oh by the kitchen staff mm, entry. Mm. <laughs> now that was very good, because the staff thought I was wonderful. Uh -huh. <laughs> that was really, well, looking back on it was quite funny. Sorry, oh, I got an A room, um, but I was the only student. The school was occupied by members of the um, embassy, members of the embassy staff. Uh, and there were a lot of these ladies mainly ladies, um, who were not my cup of tea at all. Oh. They were people who belonged to a different class on the whole. Right. Not all of them, but most of them. Yeah. One or two of them didn't mind uh, or were quite willing to, um, perhaps quite happy to walk about um, the town with me and be told what I could remember about it. <laughs> but on the whole, they were not uh, not interested. And um, the staff, the embassy staff, thought I was a bit, uh, bit off, as it were, all except for the ambassador's secretary's secretary, because I would take her dog for a walk. Having this dog for a walk was a great advantage because all those men who wanted to flirt with me, <laughs> all those men who wanted to flirt with me didn't like the dog. <laughs> and the dog, I don't like dogs, but uh, the dog, because I took it for walks, the dog thought I was lovely. <laughs> ah. I had some <clears throat> project um, for which, which I was going to work on in Rome. And when I got there, I found there was, I can't remember if it was another student, but anyway, um, there was somebody else working on this subject, uh, <laughs> which I suppose is something that always happens to me. I went, I can't remember really, but I think I went just um, to learn about Rome. The director, I suppose, um, he was John Will Perkins. Yes, indeed. And he was also new, but he had a wife with him and I think an, a, a child, but I can't remember that for certain, <clears throat> suggested that I did work in um, 
junction with him. And so I, he was working on North Africa as a result of having been there during the war. We got on quite well together and we, uh, I could do things more easily than he could. And Rome itself, was it very much damaged? It's very no, damage very... is not what I remember at all. I've no doubt it was, but I mm. didn't. Um, no. I didn't see, didn't really see anything of that sort. And then a lot of um, a lot of artists came along, and I found them a bit odd. <laughs> but, <laughs> but somehow or other, we managed mostly to get on together. The director was going. <clears throat> out to Rome in the vacations. Up to, up to Africa, mm. yes, I see. Uh, and um, almost immediately, Jocelyn Toynbee came out for the uh, vacan vacancy, vacant. Yeah, um, the vacation, yeah. And um, it was convenient, helpful um, for people, particularly women, to go together. Uh, so I went together with Jocelyn, who could get into things that I couldn't have got into. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there were there were places where you wouldn't normally, and normal visitors wouldn't go, and Jocelyn did. Yes, but also she had a reputation already by that stage. Right. Yeah. And they were quite uh, willing to right. uh, yeah. have somebody of this quality. Yeah. <laughs> so it was wonderful because yes. I got into a lot of places that um, I wouldn't otherwise have seen. I got into bits of the um, Vatican that I probably wouldn't have got into by myself. Had you learnt about epigraphy? already oh, in I Oxford? See. No, very little. Uh, but there you were, there I was with um, John saying, John saying, you go there and <laughs> see what you can find. <laughs> I found you know, the, the staff, not the staff of the school, but the school has, um, or had, a um, tennis court and, and um, <clears throat> That was used by the um, staff of the embassy. And I can't remember how this happened, but um, I got to know some of them. And that was rather helpful because they had weekend tours to um, interesting places oh. that I couldn't have got to otherwise. Yeah. So there was just two of us in there. Uh -huh. <laughs> most of the time. Uh, but the librarian, librarians, I think, mm -hmm. um, were thankful, as it were, to have, um, st have somebody come in and read. <laughs> when you got back to England, were you there for, what, two years altogether? Or um, less? Yes, I was there for Gosh, two years. amazing. And then you went straight into teaching once you got back. Well, then I... Um, Applied for a job in the only job seemed to be um, on uh, going at that stage. Um, I applied for it, and there was a great fuss because the man in charge of um, Roman studies was uh, anti-woman, very anti-woman, and I converted him. Well, he never had a, a, a woman. Who was, see, I worked during the war, and in the war, during the war, you you worked, as it were, and whatever they said, <clears throat> you still went on working. Yes. <laughs> and um, he'd never met anybody like that. <laughs> so when I um, just went on doing things, uh, he was rather startled at first. <laughs> I did my bit for women. <laughs> He ran the um, ancient material classes um, <coughs> in uh, Newcastle and around Newcastle. Mm -hmm. 
And in the first place, I liked Newcastle, which I thought was a lovely place. I'd always hated leaving it. <laughs> um, and uh, in the second, I found the work interesting and I could expand on it, you see, and I did. And he never thought of a woman doing that. He was very cross initially. <laughs> What's she doing this? <laughs> um, and then he found it was rather useful. So in the end, we were quite good friends. <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. <laughs> well, I think everyone has since discovered that you, you, you generally do do wonderful things. So that's terrific. But it was truly wonderful to hear these words from Joyce Reynolds, considering how important uh, she's been in developing this field, her crucial contributions to our understanding of Libyan epigraphy and the legacy that Joyce uh, left, and how these uh, has been used very recently for the development of new resources such as the IRSIRE, uh, digital publications of the inscriptions of Roman Cyrenaica, which I think is a tremendously important thing. So very useful to have this corpus, finally, of the Roman period inscriptions of Cyrenaica all collected uh, in a single corpus. So uh, this was really wonderful. So it is now time to wrap up and we have a general conclusion about the workshop and about Tripolitania, its past, present and future. And I'd like to very briefly introduce our speaker, David Mattingly, who actually needs no introduction because David is very well known to all of us and the international community for the importance of his work on Libya, uh, especially the Fazan, his own contribution to Tripolitania, as well as the broader uh, work on North Africa. So David Mattingly is professor of Roman archaeology at the University of Leicester, and he has been involved in so many fieldwork projects and collaborations with the BSR, Bilnas in particular. And today he kindly agreed to uh, give this presentation, which is titled From a Film and Paper Research Tradition to a Digital Present and Future, Reflections on Tripolitania. So over to you, David. Thank you very much, Nicola. I hope you can all hear me. I hope you can see my screen sharing. Yes, I think it's working. Fine. Okay, terrific. Um, so I'm really sorry that I can't be with you in person today. Uh, kind of combination of the start of term in the UK and the fact that I'm due to go on field work very shortly uh, means my time is uh, rather pressured, rather more pressured than I was imagining when I uh, agreed to be part of this. But it's been fantastic to, to participate online. And I'd like to start by thanking all of the contributors for their very stimulating presentations and also to the BSR and to Bill Nurse for organizing uh, such an interesting event. Well, as the carcasses of my many uh, wrecked cameras remind me, they sit on a shelf. Uh, these are just three of many, uh, many more, I should say, in my study at home. I've been working in Libya for a very long time, and my career spans the transition from film to digital. Like the cameras, I'm increasingly feeling a bit of a technological fossil from another age. So I think that there were two key uh, objectives of the workshop this morning. Firstly, to emphasize the urgency, importance, and potential of archive work at this time. And secondly, uh, the contributors have highlighted the digital shift in research and the significance of converting traditional forms of paper record and publication to new digital formats. IRT is a superb example 
of how the digital version can enhance the, uh, uh, the print original by bringing supplementary material uh, into the corpora, allowing more imagery, for instance, text searches, uh, and so much more. We've also uh, been reminded of the enormous contributions of Joyce Reynolds, and it was such a pleasure to hear her voice uh, again just now. IRT 2021, of course, is a great memorial to her work. I'd like to pay my own tribute uh, to her, particularly for her support of young researchers entering the field. I still have an extraordinary vivid memory of the first letter I got from Joyce after I'd braved up the courage to send her a short note that I was working on uh, that touched on epigraphic matters. And the note began, please don't see red when you see how much red I've put on your typescript. And in truth, there were more of her words in red than mine in the typescript. But it was a, a tremendously useful uh, and important lesson for me in how to do rigorous research. And the first of many times on which I consulted her and benefited from her knowledge and, and wisdom. Of course, it's not just Bill Nass and the BSR who are busy on such uh, projects. And we've uh, been reminded about the, work, the wonderful work that's going on between Italian and Libyan colleagues at the moment uh, by Andrea Zocchi's presentation this morning, for instance. In concluding the workshop, though, I hope you'll forgive me taking a slightly autobiographical perspective. My research career over 40 plus years now has spanned the great transition from film and paper records to digital by default projects. My main field work in Libya took place from the late 1970s into the 1980s, and most of the important publications on that work uh, appeared in the 1990s. So I'm looking back at progress in the field across the digital divide. My introduction to Tripolitania was the Libyan, uh, UNESCO Libyan Valis survey, already mentioned in a number of presentations. And there are important paper and film uh, records that are currently being uh, catalogued for the Bilnas archive. And we hope in due course to make more of these available uh, in digital formats. There's lots of paper forms, black and white prints, color slides, and so on. It's important to emphasize that that survey used uh, fairly primitive mechanical methods, uh, mechanical theodolites, uh, levels, plane tables, tape measures. Um, we, we lack the modern digital uh, re recording tools of, of today. And our use of aerial photography um, was it, uh, achieved by the rather hazardous method of uh, literally flying a kite and in some cases crashing the cameras uh, suspended thereon. And we had no way of checking the quality of, of the pictures that we'd taken until we were back from the field and had, had them developed in the lab. And that black and white photo in the middle at the top of Gerrit al Garbia is uh, an example of a photograph that was so nearly perfect, but not quite. When we were surveying in the pre-desert waters, we had no decent maps. Um, and only after a few years did we start to acquire the first uh, a very low resolution satellite images uh, from which to, uh, to construct those maps. So in most of the years of our survey, a basic task of the recording teams was first to rather slowly and painfully uh, construct a map of the wadis that we were actually trying to uh, then plan sites uh, 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 within. The survey, for instance, at the bottom left of this uh, slide took a team of about six of us, as I remember, about a week to accomplish. Now one could do a much better map, I think, including uh, capturing the fine detail of the individual site components in rather more in rather more detail than we managed in that survey uh, in the course of an afternoon. So these are just a few of the details areas, and you can see the quality of uh, of, of of detail of the the archaeological sites that we've given numbers to that can actually be drawn directly from the satellite imagery today. My more recent engagement with Tripolitania has been through co-directing the Endangered Archaeology 
uh, of the Middle East and North Africa project uh, with colleagues from Oxford and Durham and also local partners in 20 MENA countries. This project started in 2015 and the database now contains hundreds of thousands of sites. The project involves both systematic documentation of sites of all period and identification of threats and damage occurring to them. In Libya, for instance, one striking example of how we can use this data uh, concerns the Islamic Sufi shrines, a high percentage of which have been damaged or destroyed since 2011. Another benefit of such a large data set is that we can start to look at major causes of damage. Looting, vandalism, and conflict grab the media headlines, but these uh, sorts of damages are, to be honest, in a minority. The biggest cause of destruction and damage, which is accelerating across the Middle East and North Africa, are agriculture and urban expansion. It has to be said, though, that this, uh, this damage from agriculture and urban expansion has often been made worse by a reduction in effective regulation as a result of the political difficulties in many parts of the region since 2011, and this is very much true of Libya. One of my big research interests has always been the rural settlement of Tripolitania, especially uh, in the Roman period. And it's been tremendously exciting to see a new generation of researchers with far better digital skills than me uh, working on the uh, potential of the satellite image analysis, GIS, and so on. And here are a couple of books uh, published recently by, by Bilnas, but I'd also like to uh, add, a, add a shout out for the work of Andrea Zocchi, uh, who did a PhD with me on the landscape around Lepkis Magna as well, as another work in this, in this line. When I was responsible in the late 1990s for compiling the Libyan map sheets for the Barrington Atlas, this work was still done in colored pencils on tracing paper with uh, handwritten labels uh, added to these multiple sheets before being sent off to the printers. It involved, for me, a, a somewhat desperate uh, attempt sometimes to locate many imprecisely recorded sites. And overall, looking back, I'm amazed at how relatively close many of the mapped locations have turned out to be. It was almost impossible on a non-zoomable map to re record adequate detail of rural settlement, however. And at one level, the Barrington Atlas is frustratingly a map of places, a set of maps of places uh, with known ancient names. But the advance of GIS satellite uh, coverage and zoomable uh, digital formats means it's much more fo uh, feasible today to map all types of settlements and sites of given periods if they're visible on imagery or if their coordinate locations are recorded. And it's particularly important that more and more of this data is becoming available in open data sets. As noted, projects like Yamina actively, uh, are actively building a large open data set against which modern urban uh, expansion and infrastructure projects or changes in farming patterns can be assessed. At the moment, a member of the Leicester team, Nicole Sheldrick, is leading work on automated change detection to try to improve uh, our, our advanced warning of damaging impacts in the broader landscape context. That's a practical aspect of how we may use the new data but I want to also ask how we may maximize the research potential. And to do this, I think, we need often uh, to have uh, multiple data sets that we can link up. So we need to think about data at different, uh, at different scales of analysis. Um, these might be very small localities, these might be uh, individual regions like the Politania, or it might be uh, the totality of that vast expanse of Maghreb and Sahara that we can see on this map. Crucially, I think we do need to go beyond national boundaries. Uh, and one of, the, one of the limitations clearly with resources like IRT is it is simply limited to the Libyan part of a, of a larger territory. 
So just to finish off with a, a few examples of the sorts of maps that uh, ought to be possible to produce from digital data sets, although I, I'd emphasize that the maps that, that follow are to some extent more fairly traditional maps compiled uh, by me with the assistance of Martin Sterry um, in, in, from uh, available data, both published and digital. But they, I hope they will illustrate some of the potential of using data at different scales of analysis. So this is a map of ancient olive and wine presses across North Africa. And I think one can see the, the importance of Tripolitania, the density of um, material in Tripolitania in this map, but also the, the really huge scale of production that was achieved in parts of Eastern Algeria and Tunisia as well. This map uh, is, is designed partly based on, on the data in IRT to look at the geographical uh, in, uh, aspects of the epigraphic habit in rural Tripolitania. One of the limitations of IRT, even though in its new uh, edition it's trying to incorporate that Latino Punic um, and uh, Neo Punic uh, date, data as well, is that it is very much limited uh, to the eastern part of what was a larger territory. And one of the things that uh, comes across, I think, in comparing uh, east and west is that there are some significant differences. There's a much more emphasis on the strength of Punic language, very clear in this map uh, in eastern Tripolitania compared to the west. We might also note uh, a somewhat signature of uh, Libyan language use uh, in um, the, the sort of northwestern end uh, of Tripolitania. And finally, you know, I think it, if we if we extend our our, our our comparison to look at other areas of North Africa, uh, what also strikes me is how relatively un uh, unliterate the rural landscapes of Tripolitania were when compared to say the ter territory directly around the town of Thugger, which we see at the bottom left, and the little blue rectangle at the bottom of, the, of my main map of Tripolitania shows the area of that map to bottom left, which contains more Latin inscriptions in a very, very small area than the entirety of rural Tripolitania. So very different scales of engagement with the epigraphic habit in some other regions of North Africa. And that must tell us something quite important about the nature of Tripolitanian society just as those divergent language uh, preferences from Latin to uh, Punic uh, to Libyan uh, do as well. And this map reminds us of the importance of a Libyan inscribing habit during the Roman period. Uh, this doesn't include uh, an extensive uh, deeper Saharan distribution of, of Libyan inscriptions uh, uh, as well. But as we can see, there are parts of North Africa, where uh, there really are now quite considerable numbers of groups of Libyan inscriptions of Roman date uh, now recorded. And I think um, there's probably more of this material to add for areas like Libya uh, as well. If we recognize that this is part, an important part of the epigraphic uh, habit in the region. Well, that's more or less the end of my points. I'll just finish with a few uh, uh, note, just brief notes uh, to uh, finish up on summarizing what we've heard this morning. I think cataloging and digitizing of archives is clearly uh, going to be an essential element of work going forward, but it is expensive and it needs uh, more consistent standards. The creation of all sorts of digital data sources are equally critical Again, uh, a key requirement here, uh, already mentioned by several contributors, is the need for open linked data um, and the compatibility of data sets to allow researchers to link between them. And I, I think, again, very clear from many of the contributions we've heard, we need to be investing in the younger generation who are techno technically, technologically equipped to do this work. So lots of potential, but I think I'd also just finish on highlighting those challenges and risks. Firstly, open data and collaboration 
are fundamental, but they're not guaranteed. Uh, secondly, data standardization and linked data uh, compatibility um, are really, really important across uh, the BIRI institutions, across the Nahan institutions. Funding and time needed to do the work, uh, it's, it's, it's an enormous undertaking that lies ahead of us to uh, translate all the old records. And finally, and this is the real warning, digital obsolescence. Again, uh, in my uh, career, I've observed many resources um, ex uh, being expensively compiled since the 1990s and then sliding into obsolescence through non-sustainability going forward. So I think thinking about the sustainability of what we record, uh, record is also really important. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, David, for this excellent conclusion, uh, highlighting uh, the importance of work on Tripoli Tenia, so how this has evolved through time, including your own work, and also uh, for highlighting the challenges around uh, these topics. And indeed, it is true. Uh, we have to be aware of uh, long-term issues, the long-term maintenance and preservation issues of both physical and online collections and how this is done. And I think it's really important that we engage in this conversation with different stakeholders and uh, experts from different fields and different professions. So for instance, when we look at archaeological archives, like the vast majority of the archives that we are dealing with, um, we mainly as archaeologists, uh, we don't have the specific knowledge to deal with this collection. So it is really, really important that we talk to archivists. And so what has been done at the BSR, also what Bilnas has been doing precisely to provide a comprehensive cataloging of its resources to uh, ask professional archivists to do these tasks, because otherwise archeologists just don't have the necessary knowledge, uh, obviously. So yes, I think that these collaborations are really, really the key and to try and make the data as accessible as possible. And, and I'd like to point out, for example, some of the recent Bilnas publications, which David mentioned, and some of which I also highlighted in my brief presentation, uh, these are all available as online open access. So anyone can, can access them from uh, any part of the world. And so they are supposed to be accessible to everyone. So this is really, really important, I think. So we now have time for a final discussion about what David has been saying in his presentation as well as some of the topics which were raised in the previous presentation. So is that if anyone has any questions or comments, please uh, do uh, join the discussion. One at the moment. <laughs> well, uh, I think it was really striking what you were saying, David, uh, about the inscriptions. So showing the amount of inscriptions recovered from the hinterland of Dugga, uh, the, uh, how many were found there if compared uh, to the entire region of Tripolitania. So that is quite striking. And one should rightly ask these questions of, how, how can we explain uh, all of this? And you, you also correctly said that when we speak of Tripolitania, 99% uh, of the time we just focus ourselves on the Libyan part of Tripolitania, we forget uh, of the other bit of it, uh, the Western part of it. So it is important that this uh, part of Tripolitania is also included in the discussion. Uh, so yes, I think that was really important. Can I um, j j just sort of pose a question to others in, in, in the room? Because, uh, you know, from the presentations we've heard, there are clearly people who know a lot more about archives and digital resources uh, than I do. And I'd just be interested to, to hear people's views, particularly on that 
that last point about how we how we avoid digital obsolescence with the sort of resources that we are we're, we're trying to create at this time. Yes, Alessandra, I think, and then Lisa. Yes, David, I was thinking of that, your last point, which is uh, a very good one. And I think that we, uh, we should think when uh, doing these digital projects, we should plan carefully before embarking on a digital project and reflecting on formats, reflecting on standards, reflecting on interoperability and being sure that these resources will be accessible uh, in the long run. So digital preservation is something that accompanies the digital imaging projects. And as far as we are concerned at the BSR, we are relying on TIFFs formats, there are, but there, there are new ones and new formats, especially a new one that uh, uh, has been, not recently, I cannot say recently, but for a few years uh, uh, has been adopted by uh, the, the Vatican Library, and it's called FITS. So, and it guarantees, it guarantees, I don't know if, I mean, um, it's a standard de facto, and uh, also the Jure, so it means that it's uh, has been uh, acknowledged as a, a reliable format, and it guarantees uh, uh, long-term access to the digital outputs and resources that we produce. So it would be maybe interesting to also talk to other parties, other institutions that are adopting such standards, and uh, essential, it's essential to, to take this into consideration and ensure that data uh, that we produce today are accessible in, in the future because we may be sure about how to preserve uh, physical objects and you showed us the evolution of your research um, beginning with uh, films so he, he reminds me of what was done here at the BSR with Ward Perkins and then the shift you made into the digital realm so yes I uh, this is the answer I can give at the moment mm -hmm. But uh, exchange of knowledge, exchange of experience, and uh, could be uh, beneficial to, to, to all of us. And also looking a bit at other institutions, what they, they are doing with the archives and the resources. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Alessandra. Um, Lisa, would you like to say something? Yeah, yeah um, it's, a, it's a real issue. Um, as many of you know, I started a project called Fasti Online with IAC almost 20 years ago. And um, the rude shock, but I mean, I was prepared for it and working on it, was to get thrown off the University of Texas at Austin server with no... Um, warning whatsoever because our PHP was out of date and we presented a security issue. So the whole site went down for a month. It was moved thanks to the generosity of the Museum of London Archaeology Service um, to a server there. And we are now completely changing the platform. Um, what we're doing is I think what a lot of people are doing which is going over to Arches, which is the Getty uh, GIS queryable platform. It's gonna need quite a lot of work, quite a lot of additions of objects and things, but at least it is a platform that we know will be updated. And the problem with all of, I mean, you remember the 90s where everybody's brother-in-law was building them? And, you know, the, the <laughs> Archivio Centrale, the, 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 what is it, the um, ICCD made all these fabulous databases that just died. I mean, 
thousands and thousands and thousands devoted to the work on these things that are dead and irretrievable. So it's a, it's a very serious point. And I think we have to look at these common solutions like Getty's arches, which are available. Absolutely. And I think Charlotte would like to add something. You're muted. I was, I was just going to say that this is, this has been, an, you know, a worry for 20, 30 years. That it was clearly, when we first all started going online, there was clearly a worry. Uh, paper we knew survived, although the history of manuscripts is a reminder that books survive because they are in multiple copies. Hmm. Not because the individual object is so secure. And I, I think that's, that's quite an important thing to, 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 to think about all the time. Um, but I, I, would, I would say that what we've gradually, I've learned a huge amount, uh, mostly from people much younger than myself, about how one does this. One has to be endlessly committed to a concept of standards. And back in the 90s and 2000s, we all thought, here's a liberating thing, I can do it my own way. And the concept of standards sounded restrictive. But I always look at my bookshelf and think how difficult it is to put the books in order because they're all different heights. And I'm sure you all have that problem. If I could have the whole run on this particular topic, but actually I can't because there's one book that's much bigger. And it really wouldn't have hurt if they'd all been in standard sizes. It wouldn't have been a problem. But it's a real, it's, it, it's a kind of typifies the fact that the standards one needs to adopt don't have to alter the content of what you have, but they are crucial to making it available and easy to manage and easy to look after. And with your bookshelf, you can just put those tall books somewhere else but already you've complicated the system. And when you do that digitally, a very small change can be a real nuisance. I do think the, it's important now that governments have realized that they've put a lot of money into projects um, which need to be, uh, and they don't want to see it all disappear. And most universities, increasingly funding bodies are insisting that you deposit your data in a secure repository run by the institution. Now, our institutions, I mean, my institution only got that organized about a year ago. This is, this is recent stuff, but it is increasingly important both to make our stuff available as much as we can, but also to store the data in reliable places. And I would argue one extra thing in as many places as possible on the same principle of the book. Reduplication is what preserves things more than any other thing. Yes, thank you very much, Charlotte, for raising these important points. You're absolutely right. Uh, and the parallels with books <laughs> work <Yeah>. very well. <laughs> absolutely, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Um, so I think there is a question from our online audience asking about whether there are any plans to create an online photographic archive of the Libyan and Punic inscriptions of Tripolitania, especially those from the pre-Saharan region. So I don't know if anyone would like to say something about that. I think Caroline would like to. So there are plans afoot for an online platform of Punic inscriptions from Tripolitania, starting with the Neo-Punic material, but hopefully also leading to include the older Punic material and uh, the uh, Latino Punic and the Libyo-Bourbon as well. Um, the degree to which that will be a 
fully operational photographic archive uh, is dependent on how many photographs have already been taken and how much access we have to material um, as, we can, as we start building this, this platform, but it is forthcoming. Um, and hopefully there will be more of an update on when it begins early next year. Well, fantastic, thank you for the update. Do keep us posted on this. Anyone else has any questions or comments? I don't think we have any questions from the online audience. And well, everybody seems to be quite happy here in the live audience as well. So I think we can conclude here. Now I would like to thank again uh, all the participants all the speakers who contributed today with the wonderful presentations and the very engaging work that has been done uh, around this topic. Um, so thank you, thank you very much for all of this. I'd like to thank again the BSR for hosting this event and try and make this possible both as, a, as an in-person and a online event, which is going to be the future, I think. So it's good to see that these things are happening. And I would like to thank Bill Nas as well as a partner in uh, setting up this workshop. And so thank you everyone. And I'd like to invite our speakers to join us for lunch upstairs. And well, see you very soon. <clears throat>